Hey Rob, it's Josh here. Just wanted to give you a quick overview and try to see if we can troubleshoot uh, your bow drill and get you successful. A um, couple things that I saw, your your spindle was flying out. So just you know to to kind of show you kind of how I do it. When I'm making a spindle, I make it like kind of like a big kindergarten pencil, uh, and this is a little shorter than normal. But this is a piece I had. This is a brand new set. I've used it I think once, uh, and it's a little pithy on the end or a little punky on the end. So. Uh, but it still works. Uh, so maybe thumb thickness, and normally I'd want it to be a little longer so I can get more out of it, but you know, long and short doesn't really matter that much to me. Um, I'll use them, I've used them as, as short as, you know, three, four inches, and then you can always, you know, compound those uh, into a composite if you wanted to, but, but either way, I'll use these until I, you know, no longer can. Uh, the key thing is, though, is you want blunt on the bottom, and you want a sharp point on the top because when that sits in, this is an example socket, when that sits in the socket, you want very little, very little friction up there, as little as possible. You want all the friction to be focused down there. For your actual bearing block, I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of some, I guess you could call them commercial bearing blocks to give you an idea. This is a SC Fire Steel that has a divot in it that works perfectly. This is one that I made just out of a measuring spoon um, from the dollar store and I drilled a hole out right there into a piece of cherry and I epoxied that in and sanded it smooth. Uh, so those are a couple different options. So what I wanted to show you those for is your, your divot in your bearing block, your goal is about a quarter teaspoon, right? So gauge that uh, out of your, out of your uh, kitchen, just grab one of these, you know, an eighth to a quarter teaspoon that's kind of the shape you're going for and about the depth you're going for. It'll keep your spindle from flying out on you as much. Um, I'm going to use a piece of fat wood because I have a lot down here. But that divot, if you look, is basically like that quarter teaspoon. One way you can test that is put your pencil point up in there and move it left, right, up and down in a circle to see if it's going to fly out on you. And that'll give you a good idea of whether or not it's a good suitable bearing block and if you've gone deep enough. So hopefully that helps take care of that. And the, the lubrication in the top, I use the fat wood because the resin is self-lubricating and there's very little friction up top here and it's a good solid piece of wood. You want your bearing block to be a hard wood, uh, harder than your actual set. Now this set is, uh, is actually out of the same piece of wood. Uh, it's both, both cotton wood. I just made it um, and like I said, I've used it once and you've already figured out how to uh, go through step one, which is burn in and notch. Another thing to consider that I noticed is uh, your spindle was very long, so it forces you into a more upright position. Let's see if I can move this for you. It forces you kind of into a more upright position. And when you think about it, if, when, when you're shooting a rifle from a kneeling position, it's more stable the lower you get and you can get more points of contact. So that's kind of what I look at when I'm doing my bow drills, is I'm getting into a stable position as I can as if I'm shooting a rifle. And for me, a shorter spindle allows me to really sink down, get points of contact all through here, and then I can rest the crook of my wrist. Let me move you back down. I'll rest the crook of my wrist right on my shin bone, and that locks it into place, because you don't want a lot of movement here because that'll force your spindle to wobble and put side pressure on it and it can pull it out and make it fly out also. So something to think about. Um, for that taller spindle when you're way up here, you're less stable in my opinion. The other thing to think about is your actual bow. Uh, this is a piece of devil wood. This is uh, uh, wild olive. But yeah, they call it devil wood super hard. So when I push on this, all of the force that I'm driving into this is actually translating directly into the bow in a straight movement. If you use something that's a little less uh, rigid, when you push on it, it tends to, to kind of expand the bow. And what that'll do is that'll put left and right pressure on that spindle, causing it to fly out rather than directly forward, if that makes sense. So, a nice rigid bow is what I like to use. It doesn't matter if it's straight, doesn't matter if it's curved, doesn't matter if it's got a huge bow in it. What matters is, is when you push force on that forward, that that gets translated directly forward and not to the side either way. Uh, same thing when you're bowing. 
make sure when that spindle's in place, you're not putting pressure left and right. It needs to be straight the entire time. So you're directly translating that forward momentum into a circular motion with the mechanical advantage of the string. As far as putting your spindle in with a longer bow, it doesn't matter if your spindle ends up on the inside or the outside. That's pretty tight. See, I've got my spindle on the outside in this case. Um, what that does when it's on the outside is it allows me to go the full length of the bow from knot to knot and I get the most efficient bowing motion, the best mechanical advantage I can possibly have. If this was on the inside and the bow was too short, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the wood as I'm bowing and I'm going to lose, you know, three to four inches on either end. So we're talking a six to eight inches less for every stroke, which is just less efficient. You can still get a fire that way, so don't get too worried about that. But if you have a short bow and you're on the inside, it's absolutely going to make a difference. And if you over bow and you hit with this under tension, if you hit that, you can knock your spindle out. Whereas on the outside, it would just go to the knot back and forth. So in the beginning, it's more important to get the technique down so you can actually take advantage of that mechanical advantage to its fullest extent, the most efficient way possible. So in the beginning, just focus on using the entire length of the bow and keeping the bow parallel to the ground. If I'm running parallel, the string stays basically in the center. If I let the bow tip up, then the string is going to climb. If I let the, the bow, if I let the bow tip, tip down when I'm bowing, the string is going to work its way towards the bottom. I want it to stay parallel and I want that string to stay in the middle when I'm bowing. You're going to focus on staying straight, maintaining a rigid position here so your spindle stays straight up and down. Just focus on bowing parallel to the ground and using the entire length of the bow. And you don't want to short stroke it and you don't want to be in a hurry to make a cold because you're not there yet. You just let it happen by going nice and smooth. Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Once you start getting some smoke, then you can maybe put it a little more downward pressure and increase the speed. But when you increase the speed, don't short stroke it and don't bear down on it to where you're wobbling so much that your spindle flies. Let's see if we can't get a, an ember going here for you. But in the beginning, I just want you to focus on keeping the bow parallel. Get a little tilt here. Keep the bow parallel and use the entire length. And you can see when I start off, I start off slow and allow the end of that spindle and that divot in my hearth board to kind of merge and become smooth. I'm not going for anything right now. Step two after you've got your notch carved and you're burned in is to just fill your notch with fuel so that when you do light it and get an ember in step three, it has something to feed off of. So right now, all I'm trying to do is smooth everything out. You see it's not running very smooth, but it'll work. Keeping my bow parallel, not even trying hard, and using the full length of the bow for the most efficiency. All I'm doing right now is trying to fill my knot. The key thing is on my left hand side is I've got that as stable as possible. You can see how much this one's jumping because the spindle is not exactly melded in with the uh, with the divot in the hearth board very well, but I'm going to try to work through that anyway. I'm already starting to get smoke, but there's nothing to get excited about yet because my notch is not filled. I don't have. To. I'm going to fill this notch, and once I fill the notch, you see how nice and smooth that's running now. Now I can increase the speed and pressure a little bit, but I still want to maintain parallel 
and I still want to use the entire length of the bow. Let's see how nice and stable all that is. Now my notch is starting to get full, so I'm gonna to move to step three, which is to light that little pile of fuel I just made. All I have to do is keep doing parallel strokes, using the full length of the bow, and gradually increase speed and pressure until I get my ember. But you'll notice I'm not out of breath. My focus is still on using the full length of the bow. Well, guess that answered my question. Normally it doesn't have to pop out on you like that, but when it happened was it melted, or it actually, uh, worked its way in at an angle, so it eventually slipped off the front. But it still worked. All right. So, what I want to try to show you on another video probably is how to rescue an ember if for some reason it falls out before you get to this point like it did. Uh, so if it falls out like that but you didn't get to this point, you can still save that dust pile and rescue that ember, and I'll show you that in another video. Hopefully that helps you get where you're going, buddy.